Hi everybody, welcome to our study tonight. Great to have you with us. I hope you enjoy this time together. We are beginning our sixth and final session in the study. Uh, Goodbye Chicken, Hello Dove, Releasing Your Fears by Welcoming the Holy Spirit's Power. And I'm excited to uh, share with you tonight. Uh, we'll start a new study next Wednesday night. Uh, but uh, I'm looking forward to the study tonight, and I hope that you are too. Uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness, your many blessings, your faithfulness, your love and compassion. Lord, your mercies are new every morning, and we just thank you for who you are and how much you love us and care for us. And Father, we also thank you for the opportunity to study your word again tonight. Lord, open up the eyes of our hearts. Help us to clearly comprehend what you want us to comprehend in this uh, session tonight. And bless all those who are watching this live stream or uh, the recorded version later. Lord, let it minister to them and let your word go forth in power. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, as I said, we are uh, finishing up tonight our uh, session, our series of sessions on this book, Goodbye Chicken, Hello Dove, uh, Releasing Your Fears by Welcoming the Holy Spirit's Power. And I uh, trust that it will be, uh, have, it will have been a, a great blessing to you uh, this time of our study together. Um, what I want to do tonight, we've covered everything uh, in the book except the appendix which talks about how to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit and I'm definitely going to go over that tonight. But what I thought I would do is uh, uh, go through the book very quickly with a quick review of the uh, main principles that we discussed in the book because they're so so powerful and uh, I want to just go over everything we've done basically in Reader's Digest form very very quick review just to, for you to catch these main principles and if, if you're taking notes if I go too quickly you can't get them all down uh, you know uh, live uh, the good thing about this uh, form of communication is you can always go back and watch the recorded video and stop and start it and uh, jot down uh, these principles. And I encourage you to do that and, and really keep them uh, in your consciousness and apply them uh, in your walk with the Holy Spirit. All right, well, uh, the uh, premise of the book is that, of course, Goodbye Chicken, Hello Dove, is that uh, we are naturally and humanly fearful uh, to uh, do something that will launch out in ministry uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, but the Holy Spirit, if we connect with Him and uh, allow his power to flow through us, he will help us overcome all those fears and uh, all those reasons not to launch out and be used of him, and he will empower us to be used of him in a great way. Uh, he, we started out uh, talking about uh, the um, two purposes of our or two hallmarks, I should say, of Christianity. Uh, you, do you remember this? The first one was inward transformation, a change on the inside, and then secondly, outward service. So the two hallmarks of Christianity are inward transformation and outward service. Um, he says that fear is the cloud hovering over the Christian life, whether it be fear of transforming ourselves or reaching out to help others. Uh, so uh, the Holy Spirit will help us with that. Um, he talks about the origins of uh, fear or some of the concepts related to fear 
And uh, one is related to the idea of abandonment or being on our own. When Jesus began to talk to his disciples about leaving and ascending to the Father, he wanted to reassure them that they would not be alone. And he said he would send another uh, advocate, as uh, some translations translate it. It's, the Greek word is parakletos, means one, one to come alongside and help. Uh, another of the same kind. Jesus was their advocate. Jesus was the one alongside them. He said it was necessary for him to go away. And of course, after his cru crucifixion and resurrection and a brief time with the disciples, he did ascend to the Father. But he said, I don't want you to worry. I'm not abandoning you. I am sending you the Holy Spirit. He said who would be with them and in them. And uh, so they did not need to fear abandonment. Uh, he was assuring them that the Holy Spirit would come and be alongside them. Now, uh, who is the Holy Spirit? And again, uh, if you've joined us late, we're just doing a quick review of the parts of the book we've done before, and then we're going to uh, go over the appendix on how to receive the Holy Spirit. So we're, we're basically reviewing all that we've uh, studied up to this point. Who is the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit is the third member of the Trinity. Now, when we talk about the Trinity, we talk about the three members of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, uh, Jesus Christ, who became human, became flesh, and God the Holy Spirit. Um, it's important to remember there is one God. There is not three gods. There are not any other number of gods. God is one. He made that very clear in Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Um, but God has revealed himself in three eternally distinct persons of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, uh, Jesus, as I said, and God the Holy Spirit. Uh, he goes on to say, you know, we can relate to the idea of God the Father even though, um, you know, we on this earth have had varying types of experiences with fathers. Not all people's experiences have been good, but we understand the concept of a good father and we can relate to God the Father. We can relate to Jesus uh, because he took on human flesh and the scriptures record his uh, coming to earth and uh, his time here on earth. Um, but he says it's harder to relate to the Holy Spirit. And a lot of times people do relate to the Holy Spirit by the, the metaphors or illustrations that are used to describe him. A dove, oil, fire, those are some of the uh, metaphors used in Scripture to re uh, relate the concept of the Holy Spirit. But he makes the point you can't apply those, uh, you know, not every aspect of a metaphor is applicable to the the object about which you're talking in this case the holy spirit uh, we went over some misconceptions of the holy spirit that uh, first of all that he loves to upset the status quo and ruffled our dignified appearance that he comes and zaps us in church you know and uh, that causes fear because we wonder what's the holy spirit going to do you know Others think of the Holy Spirit, uh, another misconception is thinking of him in deist terms, uh, saying he basically set the universe in motion and now he's uh, disinterested. He just kind of lets it run on, his own, on its own. The third misconception about the Holy Spirit is that his ministry is a one-time event. He only uh, uh, works at the moment of our salvation. He delivers... As Tim Enlow says, uh, a lifetime sized crate of supplies without the potential for any further interaction or customer support. You know, he just does everything at once when we get saved. Now, the Holy Spirit does come to dwell within us when we're saved, uh, but that is just the beginning of his work in our life. Uh, after conviction of our sin, he comes into our lives at salvation. But he does much, much more than that. So these are misconceptions about the Holy Spirit. Uh, what's a biblically accurate picture of the Holy Spirit? He is God's personal spirit. He is God. He's as much God as the Father and as the Son, Jesus, is God. 
uh, we went over some s several scriptures uh, scriptures that describe uh, his personality. Um, God has sent the Holy Spirit alongside uh, us, he said, to help us in any way we may need it, even in complex and unique situations. So the point was made that the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, Jesus ascended to the Father after his resurrection, but he said, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to send another uh, advocate or paraclete to come and be alongside you. Isn't that great? We're not abandoned. And so he sent his, God the Holy Spirit to come and to fill us and to be with us. Okay, then in the chapter, What the Dove Does, yeah, we uh, looked at uh, how the Holy Spirit assists us in accessing God's supernatural help. Um, we showed you this, um, get it right on camera here, uh, this chart. You see the ceiling of human ability. Uh, we can only operate below that ceiling in our natural abilities. Um, but... God, the Holy Spirit, can operate both above and below the ceiling of human ability. And he, we showed you this and see how uh, human ability only operates from the ceiling down. Uh, but God's ability has two two-way arrows up and down showing that God can operate both above the ceiling of human limitation and below it. Um, so what, what does this have to do with, uh, what we're talking about? The point is that the way we said we need help, we need the Holy Spirit's help. And so the way we, uh, we get that is the Holy Spirit is able to puncture that ceiling and bring heaven's help, heaven's ability to operate, uh, above man's, uh, ceiling. He's able to bring that ability down to us and puncture that ceiling. Now, he we mentioned three main ministries of the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is uh, really important for us to understand. The first ministry of the Holy Spirit we said was supernatural purification. Purification is simply the process of making something pure. Um, he mentioned that uh, within the ministry of supernatural purification, there are two levels of purification. One happens at the moment of salvation. He calls that initiation. And then one is a process uh, throughout our Christian lives. Uh, he mentioned that as sanctification. All right. So, uh, as I said a few moments ago, when we are saved, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within us. Uh, immediately. That is initiation. He makes us righteous before God. Uh, God doesn't see our sin anymore. He sees us as righteous, uh, th as having the righteousness of Christ. And so the Holy Spirit accomplishes that. But uh, we know from experience, and Paul wrote about it in Romans 7, we know that even though we have this new status before God, we don't always live up to it, do we? We fall short, we fail, we sin. And so uh, the lifelong aspect of purification called sanctification is a process, a, a lifelong process by which uh, we uh, become more right, more holy. We become uh, more like Jesus if, if we allow the process to work. The Holy Spirit helps us to become purified in our uh, deeds, in our actions, in the way we live throughout our life. And so um, the process of sanctification, uh, if we serve the Lord any length of time, we should be uh, becoming more like Jesus. The, the, the sinful habits and practices of our old life should uh, gradually be dropping off. And so that is the um, process of sanctification. Uh, when we are saved, we gain a new nature, but we don't lose the old nature. The old nature is called the sin nature, or the King James Bible calls it the flesh. And But we gain a new nature. 
So we have a choice. Are we going to live according to our old nature, the flesh, or are we going to live according to the new nature? Well, if we allow him to, the Holy Spirit sanctifies us. To sanctify means to set apart, to make holy. He sanctifies us uh, by gradually helping us to live more and more according to the new nature and less and less to the old nature. So uh, purification is a supernatural purification is an important ministry of the Holy Spirit. First at salvation and then the, the gradual process of sanctification to bring our, our living in line with our position. And then uh, the uh, second ministry of the Holy Spirit is supernatural revelation. Supernatural revelation. The Holy Spirit reveals to us things that we couldn't know on our own. And uh, we uh, referenced uh, uh, several scriptures in the Gospel of John, chapters 14 through 16, about uh, the Holy Spirit. Jesus said he would lead us into all truth. He will teach you everything. He will remind you of everything I said, Jesus said. He will testify about me, Jesus said. So on and on. So supernatural revelation. Uh, in other words, the author says, you can trust the Holy Spirit's leadings. Sometimes, and he makes this point, you need to catch this, sometimes his leadings are counterintuitive to our natural mind. But keep in mind, he is God, the Holy Spirit. One of the characteristics of God is God is omniscient. God knows everything. The Holy Spirit knows everything. And so, uh, he will reveal to us things that we would not otherwise know. Can us into all truth. Okay. Um, then the third uh, aspect of the Spirit's ministry is supernatural ability. Uh, supernatural ability, supernatural purification first, then supernatural revelation, and then supernatural ability. Acts 1.8, Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. So Jesus prophesied that when they receive the Holy Spirit, they would receive power, they would receive ability. Why do we need supernatural ability from the Holy Spirit? Uh, the author says, because the task is too big. We are too incapable and too afraid. We are more apt to believe in the chicken's weakness than the dove's strength. And then he listed five common reasons we are afraid to personally obey the command to minister to others. Five common reasons based, he says, on our self-oriented chicken-like fears. Number one, I do not have the time or opportunity. Number two, I do not have the resources. Number three, I do not have the education or the skills. Number four, I do not know what to do. And number five, I will make mistakes. Um, well, we use those excuses, don't we? Um, and uh, he uh, points out that to overcome those excuses, uh, the supernatural ability of the Holy Spirit uh, is available to us. And that uh, comes to us through an essential experience called the baptism in the Holy Spirit or spirit baptism. Um, and uh, he referenced the several prophetic uh, verses uh, in uh, the New Testament that prophesy about the Holy Spirit being poured out. So, um, again, here's this uh, chart. Uh, you can see it. Uh, God, the Holy Spirit, helps puncture that ceiling uh, of human limitation and therefore enables us to access the Holy Spirit's power. So uh, that's, that's important to remember, the three ministries of the Holy Spirit, supernatural purification, supernatural revelation, and supernatural ability. Um, we went into part two of the book all about the Holy Spirit's power, and he did a, uh, a chapter on uh, supernatural ability in the Old Testament. 
And uh, there were three conditions mentioned for spirit empowering in the Old Testament. Uh, remember these? Number one, it was for special leaders only. Number two, the Holy Spirit's empowering followed a basic two-stage pattern, which we'll talk about. And number three, the Holy Spirit's empowering was primarily to benefit the Jewish nation. Uh, and uh, so uh, he shared examples uh, from the life of Moses uh, about uh, the fact that this Holy Spirit empowerment was for special leaders only. Uh, and uh, the, the second quality uh, was that uh, there was a two-stage pattern in uh in the receiving of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would come on uh, someone and then uh, they, would, uh, they would speak prophetically. There was verbal confirmation. So the Holy Spirit would come on the leader and then he would prophesy or speak. Uh, and what this was, this was his speaking after the Holy Spirit came on him was confirmation uh, that the Holy Spirit w uh, had empowered him. Um, the most common practical outcome in Scripture, he says, of spirit empowering is verbal. A person needs to speak what God desires them to communicate to others. So that was the two-stage pattern. The Spirit would come on them and then they would, they would speak forth. The third uh, condition of uh, spirit being poured out in the Old Testament was, or being individuals being used in the Spirit's power was uh, that it was to benefit the Jewish people, uh, the Jewish nation. Uh, and um, so, uh, so those were the three conditions in the Old Testament. Um, so uh, he concluded this um, with a prophecy from Joel chapter 2 uh, verses 28 through 29 in the Old Testament of course which says I will pour out my spirit upon all people your sons and daughters will prophesy your old men will dream dreams your young men will see visions in those days I will pour out my spirit even on servants men and women alike and he refers to this as a protocol shifting precedent setting prophecy unfolding the future of the spirit empowering so what he's saying is there were this pattern in the old testament uh, that uh, the holy spirit would come upon leaders only it would have this uh, there secondly it would have this two-stage pattern the holy spirit would come on them and they would speak prophetically and the third uh, qualification or condition was that it was for the jewish people only but in this prophecy in Joel chapter 2, there is a hint or a looking forward to the time when uh, that first condition for leaders only would be uh, done away with and that God would pour his spirit out, as Joel said, on all flesh. Men, women, young, old, uh, everyone. Uh, so... Uh, that is a great hopeful sign, a uh, prophetic sign in the Old Testament that uh, that pattern would be changed. Then he uh, moves on in the next chapter. He talked about spiritual ability in the New Testament. Uh, and uh, that uh, God would change uh, the, the conditions. He would, uh, first of all, uh, do away with the uh, requirement, as I said a moment ago, that uh, the Spirit would only come upon leaders. Uh, however, the two-stage pattern of the Spirit coming upon them uh, would be continued, but it would be modified. On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, when the Spirit came upon them, they began to speak, but they spoke in languages they hadn't learned. They didn't speak in their native language. And this pattern is repeated throughout the book of Acts. Uh, and again, it is the um, confirmation that the Holy Spirit has uh, come upon uh, or filled uh, individuals. 
Um, and then the third condition uh, in the Old Testament that the Holy Spirit's empowering was primarily to benefit the Jewish people, uh, this would now uh, be changed uh, because uh, this empowering would be for the benefit of all people, not just uh, the Jewish people. Um, okay, so um, ordinary people speaking spirit-inspired words in languages they did not personally understand would be a sign that would be repeated over and over in Acts. As I said, this is a pattern in the book of Acts. Um, now, uh, he made the point uh, in, in, a, in a section entitled, The Reason We Need This Power. Uh, he says, speaking in tongues is not a spiritual badge of superiority. Um, uh, some Pentecostals or Charismatics may uh, regard it that way, but that is not the majority. That is not what it's for. Speaking in tongues is important. It's a confirmation, as we said, of the Spirit filling us and empowering us. But the purpose of it is not just to speak in tongues, as wonderful as that is. The purpose is to do uh, supernatural ministry, to speak as the Spirit of God enables us. So it's to enable us to speak uh, to speak uh, in ministry to other people. And those five excuses, he makes the point, I do not know what to do, I don't have the training or education, don't have the resources or the time, I will make mistakes. He says, some or all of those may be true, but the Holy Spirit is like a wild card that can overcome any or all of our fears and inabilities. Um, and so, a new era had dawned in the New Testament. Now God's Spirit would be poured out on not just leaders, but on everyone. Uh, it would, uh, the, the two-stage pattern was modified. The Spirit would come on them, but they would speak in languages they hadn't learned. And again, this is confirmation, what we call in the Assemblies of God, the initial physical evidence uh, of the Holy Spirit baptism or infilling. And uh, thirdly, it was for all people. And then in the next chapter, Jesus, the dove, and us, uh, he uh, talks about uh, the criteria, first of all, in recognizing the real Messiah. In uh, Luke chapter 4, Jesus quoted from Isaiah 61, which says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Uh, we said that the Hebrew word Messiah means the anointed one. The Greek word Christ, uh, Christ is a title, not a name of, of Jesus. Christ means the same thing as the Hebrew um, word uh, Messiah. It means also anointed one. So, uh, Jesus was anointed, and anointing in Scripture uh, had two, uh, two things that made it significant. Uh, the, the ceremonial meanings were, number one, being chosen, and number two, being empowered. So, Jesus was uh, declaring that he was the Messiah, the Christ, and in fulfillment of Isaiah 61.1, he was the anointed one, the Christ, and he was anointed uh, for uh, specific purposes. And he goes on there in Luke chapter 4, Jesus did in the synagogue, and uh, the author here, Tim Enlow, mentions the four purposes of the anointing uh, of the Holy Spirit. Number one, to bring good news to the poor, the broken, the less fortunate ones. Number two, to bring freedom to the captives, the bound, the oppressed. Number three, to bring healing to the blind, the sick, and afflicted. And number four, to bring the Lord's favor, the kingdom of God, on the earth. So, uh, the Holy Spirit's power, as Jesus, I like to say Jesus was the prototype of the Spirit-filled man. Uh, and uh, we see that in these four purposes. Uh, so, he was anointed to speak or proclaim good news. 
uh, to deliver those who are oppressed or bound. We, we see in the Gospels Jesus delivered oppressed people, people bound by demonic spirits. Um, he can deliver people from habits and things that, uh, a lot of things that can bind them. Third purpose, power to heal. Uh, and this includes uh, not only physical healing, but emotional healing as well. Uh, and uh, then power to proclaim that the kingdom of God or the, the Lord's favor has come. The kingdom of God is the place of his favor. If you look in a concordance, uh, you'll see that Jesus had a lot to say about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the, uh, the rule of, of God. And so uh, that is the, the place of the Lord's favor. So Jesus was announcing that the kingdom of God, the favor of God, had come to earth. Um, so how can we receive this anointing that Jesus said he had in Luke chapter 4? What's the connection? Well, the connection is the experience of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's the experience that gives us this power. Yes, we have the Holy Spirit within us at salvation, but spirit baptism uh, fills us to overflowing, makes us full of the Holy Spirit's power, and gives us uh, this power, this anointing to carry out these ministries. Uh, so uh, he said, while someone without this experience, they can, they can do ministry and operate in some level of the Spirit's power, uh, but there is always more that can be done, and uh, this is done through the power that comes with spirit baptism. And then he says, what about the other side of the connection? What about, remember we said that uh, the second purpose of uh, in Christian life is outward service. The other part of the connection we said is we need to minister to others. Um, he said he makes the point, and we need to understand this. We don't need a dramatic prompt to minister. Uh, yes, God can do something dramatic like He did with Philip in Acts chapter eight, but He says most of the time, God will just give us a gentle nudge. He will just uh, give us a uh, just the slightest notion in our spirit that we know, need to speak to someone and minister to someone. Uh, basically ministering in the power of the Holy Spirit once you receive Holy Spirit baptism is responding to needs around us and so uh, as we do so in the Holy Spirit's power uh, he the, the Holy Spirit will enable us to minister powerfully to other people and uh, he mentions many examples of Jesus just responding to needs uh, that were around him. He uses the example of, remember connecting uh, when you were a kid, maybe two uh, old soup cans or two cups uh, with a string and speaking in one of the cans or cups uh, and pulling that string tight, the other person can hear you through the other one. He said, uh, but if you let that string go slack, the sound waves aren't carried. He said, we need to keep a tight connection God with, with God, God in us, we need the power of the Spirit to flow. That's one end uh, of the string. And then we need to keep a, a, a strong connection to people around us. Look for needs. Respond to needs. Respond to the gentle nudge of the Holy Spirit. It won't always be a dramatic prompt to minister. And uh, he gives an example of just meeting someone in a store and, and just entering into polite conversation and allowing the Holy Spirit to lead him to press a little deeper and to minister uh, to someone. Well, uh, and then part three of the book, the, the third section is how to use the Holy Spirit's power. And there was a chapter, remember this, ap atmospheres and appetites. Atmospheres and appetites. Uh, the first concept here, you know, how do we use this power? Uh, you know, how do we let it flow in our lives? Well, it's a concept of atmospheres. I must intentionally choose my atmosphere. Uh, now, he, he says it's not, he's not just talking about our physical circumstances, although that can be part of it. 
but we must choose our atmosphere because atmospheres are in our mind and spirit. The two aspects to this, first, emotional and mental atmospheres. Um, he used the example of people who are going through a terrible time, yet they're filled with joy. Uh, that's because uh, they focus on God's reality instead of their feelings. He says, we tend to unquestionably, as human beings, trust our feelings, uh, even over what the Word of God says. Uh, so, uh, if we are focused on our feelings, and say things like, my life is terrible, I've missed all my opportunities, I can never do anything great for God, why can everyone else hear God's voice but me? I hate my life, this and that. We are focusing on our feelings and we're setting a bad atmosphere uh, emotionally. Uh, so instead, our atmosphere should be set by an attitude that says, Lord, teach me to hear your voice. Teach me to know your will. Lead me where you want me to go now he said he's not saying deny our circumstances if negative things happen in your lives or use a mind over matter technique but he says instead of focusing on that spend your energy on something that builds up rather than something that pulls down and then uh, the second aspect of atmosphere to cultivate we're talking about cultivating atmosphere around us is a spiritual atmosphere um, he says, uh, this has to do with what I allow into my life. Uh, if I input positive things, uh, spiritually uplifting music and uplifting concepts, I can experience God's peace. Uh, and, and so I have my focus on that rather than things of the world uh, that will stir up my anger or unsettle me. Uh, you know, um, and so um, choosing what to input into our senses, what we focus on. Uh, and then he talked about setting our spiritual atmosphere by uh, setting up out the welcome mat for the Holy Spirit, making a specific time during our day to welcome the presence of the Holy Spirit. So we have to set our atmosphere, our emotional atmosphere, our spiritual atmosphere, so, so that uh, the atmosphere around us in our mind and spirit is conducive uh, to God getting through to us. And then the second concept here is appetites. Um, he uh, talked about the concept of you know food, and we have appetites for food certain kind of foods. Different people like different kind of foods. But we know that uh, some foods aren't conducive to us being uh, healthy, for example. And that we have to make a choice. Do I want to eat, uh, for example, that which is going to bring me immediate gratification or do I want to eat in such a way that I will uh, be happier in the long term, being healthy and, and, and fit and that sort of thing. So. He says, if you focus on your final desired outcome at your starting point, your choices now will be significantly different. Uh, he mentions three spiritual appetites that we need to cultivate. They'll come as no surprise to you. First is prayer. Uh, he says, not a bondage to say, I have to pray at an hour or a half hour, a certain period of time to be spiritual, but just uh, the... Uh, idea of making time for prayer, making it a regular habit to pray and to talk to God. Uh, the second primary appetite is the Word of God, reading it, speaking it, memorizing it, assimilating it. Um, he says you cannot know the will of God without uh, taking in the Word of God. Uh, and. Uh, so uh, those are two appetites. And the third, the third primary appetite is self-denial or consecration. Uh, it's the behavior associated with self-control. Um, someone who prays, he says, reads the word with consistency and denies his or her flesh, knows the Holy Spirit's voice better than someone who does not. It's that simple. Though it is a process, atmospheres help determine appetites, and appetites help inaugurate atmospheres. So, 
we cultivate an emotional and spiritual atmosphere and uh, then we regulate our appetites and uh, cultivate an appetite for prayer, for God's word, and for self-denial, for recognizing uh, the benefits of denying ourselves instant gratification uh, for long-term uh, good benefit to come out of that. In uh, the next chapter, he talks about uh, following the dove. Um, he makes the point the Holy Spirit is always moving, yet we don't always perceive it. Um, Sometimes he says we're too spiritually dull. Uh, he used the il illustration of opening drapes on a dark room and you see all the dust flying around in the air. That uh, outside light, that sunlight didn't bring the dust in, it just revealed what was already there. And so we need to be spiritually perceptive to um, to perceive the Holy Spirit's moving. Uh, and we've become accustomed to, uh, you know, not being tuned in to the God, uh, God the Holy Spirit moving in the spiritual realm. Um, so, so we need to perceive how the Holy Spirit is moving. And he mentions six principles to recognize the Spirit's leading more clearly. This is an important chapter. We, God, the Holy Spirit, is always moving. He's always doing something. He's always leading us, if we'll recognize it. He always is active. He always wants ministry to take place. But understand the point. We don't perceive it often because we're not spiritually tuned in. So he gives six principles for us to recognize the Spirit's leading more clearly. Number one, uh, the Spirit's leading grows through relationship and spiritual intimacy. Okay? Uh, the more time we spend in God's presence, the more time we seek Him, we will become familiar with uh, His leading and His voice. Secondly, uh, the Spirit's leading must line up with the word and mission of Jesus. The Holy Spirit will never lead you to do something contrary to God's word or contrary to uh, the mission of Jesus, which of course is to uh, save uh, lost souls and to build up people into his image. So uh, Spirit's leading always has to align with God's word and Jesus' mission. Thirdly, Spirit's leading is often quieter and less spectacular uh, than anticipated. We made that point earlier. We, if we're perceptive enough, we can uh, perceive the Holy Spirit's leading in gentle nudges and, and uh, just gentle promptings, not having to be dramatic, as we said. Fourthly, um, the Spirit's leading is never based on 100% intellectual certainty. Um, the promptings, this is important, the promptings of the Spirit do not come from our brain, they come from the Holy Spirit and flow to our spirit. Our intellect cannot fully understand them and often does not like them because they are not intellectually based. Um, we may have spiritual certainty, he says, yet at the same time have considerable intellectual concerns. When we cultivate uh, a sensitivity to the Spirit's leading, he will lead us in ways that might uh, not line up with our intellectual understanding and uh, but we become familiar with his leading and even though we may not be a hundred percent on board intellectually we know that God's Spirit has led us do you see how this comes about through a cultivation of perceiving the Spirit's leading um, fifthly he says Understanding the Holy Spirit's leading is a developing process. Um, it takes a while. Sometimes he might just lead us uh, to go speak to someone. Well, what do I say? Well, he doesn't give us the whole amount. He says, I'll tell you what to say. And so we begin to speak to someone and just maybe one thought or a question comes to mind. So we engage them 
And then what happens? They respond and the Holy Spirit gives us more of a response. It develops as we trust the Holy Spirit and plunge in. Uh, and we can do that if we cultivated his leading. So it's a developing process. And number six, he says, um, understanding the Spirit's leading grows with experience. Um, so the more we are familiar with his leading and his voice, uh, the more uh, perceptive of we are of of uh, what he wants us to do. And he used the example of Samuel when he was a young child and God speaking to him. He didn't know it was God. He thought it was Eli the high priest. And finally, Eli realized God was speaking to him and instructed the young, the young boy Samuel to just say, Lord, speak, I'm listening. And of course, then Samuel grew up into a great prophet, a man of God, and was, was known for hearing God's voice. So it comes with experience. He closed this chapter by saying the Holy Spirit is always moving. Open the curtain of fear, allow the light of his mission to guide you, and you will see his power moving all around you. Follow the dove's gentle leading. And then the last chapter that we covered last week is the chicken dove gauge. Um, sometimes uh, the Holy Spirit will be leading us in a direction and uh, we see, hearkening back to those five excuses, uh, we see the gauge more on the chicken side, in other words, the fear side. And uh, that's what we feel like. I, I, boy, I can't do this. And well, we have all those excuses. Um, but when we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, when we receive that experience, uh, we receive more uh, anointing than ever before. And so we can be full. The gauge more on the chicken side. He, he uh, had these two um, diagrams. See the upper one. Uh, is uh, sees the the indicator more toward the chicken side uh, and that's based on our natural fear and inhib inhibitions uh, but the bottom one is more the reality based on being filled with the Holy Spirit and uh, having more of the confidence that comes with being filled with the Spirit's power um, he talks about the process, that it's a lifetime process of being filled. And um, so uh, God, we have the experience of baptism in the Holy Spirit. Uh, and we're going to talk more about that in a minute. And God fills us with his Holy Spirit. There's a two-stage process. The Spirit comes on us and fills us. And then we speak prophetically in an unknown language. We speak in tongues, confirming that the Holy Spirit has, uh, has filled us. Uh, and, uh, but the filling, there's, there's that one time initial baptism, but the, there are many, many fillings. And so he said we should be, being filled should be a continual process. Ephesians uh, chapter 5 says be filled with the spirit and it's be being filled it's an, the, the Greek there is an ongoing process so we should uh, not just seek a one-time experience being baptized in the Holy Spirit and speaking in other tongues as wonderful as it is but uh, following that we should desire to be continually being filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit all right uh, and as we do that we'll begin to see the the gauge uh, more toward the dove or the confidence side than the fear side. All right, well, that's a review of what we've done up to this point. For the next few minutes, I want to go over the appendix of the book, which is entitled How to Receive Spirit Baptism. And if you're watching this live stream and you've not received this experience with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, I, I want to share with you from this appendix here how to receive spirit baptism. Uh, he makes the point um, that the first of all, the only qualification needed to experience spirit baptism is that you are saved. Okay, it's 
it's no longer just for leaders only. You don't have to be a super duper Christian. Uh, it's not a deluxe version of Christianity. It's available to every born again believer. So the only qualification is that you're born again, that you're saved. Uh, if you're watching this live stream or this video and you haven't received Christ, I encourage you to uh, confess your sin and ask Jesus to come into your heart, forgive you of your sin. And the Bible says once you do that, you're a new creation, you're a child of God, and then you're eligible to receive spirit baptism. He, he says here, if you're struggling with some sort of sin issue, ask Jesus for fresh forgiveness and proceed to seek him. He will not withhold his spirit's power from you. He says the most important step in receiving the baptism is to get as close to Jesus, the baptizer, as you can. Then he mentions the three phases in receiving spirit baptism. The first one is vulnerability. There is an underlying principle, he says, in receiving anything from God, vulnerability. Vulnerability toward God involves a humbling ourselves when, we, when receiving from him. If you want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, you will need to draw near in prayer. Prayer is a state of vulnerability. Give your best effort to lowering your guard moment by moment, trying to yield more and more to him. Pray vulnerable. Pr you may need to pray vulnerable prayers expressing how much you need God. Do it for a few minutes before you sense the next phase beginning to happen. So make yourself vulnerable. Pray to God. Tell him how much you, you need him and you want him in your life. Ask him to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Make yourself vulnerable. Lower your guard before him in seeking to receive spirit baptism. And then he's the second phase, awareness, after some time of vulnerable vocal prayer, you will begin to become aware of the Holy Spirit's presence falling upon you or stirring you deeply. Jesus is responding as you cry out vulnerably. His presence will not scare you. Listen to this. You will not be out of control. He says, you may sense that he, he falls upon you, then his presence lifts. This is not because you have made a mistake. This is a common experience. You will find that if you choose to draw near in vulnerability again, his presence will fall upon you again. So as you make yourself vulnerable and, and ask God to fill you, um, you'll sense an awareness of the Holy Spirit's presence falling on you. Jesus is beginning to pour out the Spirit on you. The third phase, vulnerability first, then awareness of the Spirit falling on you second. The third phrase is cooperation. Let me read to you here from this. Now that the Holy Spirit is being poured out upon you, you must learn to cooperate with His gentle leading. He Understand this because a lot of people have misconceptions about this. He will not make you speak in tongues. See, I can't stress that enough. I've, I've highlighted that and underlined that here in the text. And it's, it's awesome that uh, the author here, Tim Enlo, makes that point. Speaking in tongues is not the Holy Spirit taking you over and forcing you to speak in tongues. You actually must cooperate with the Holy Spirit. He says you must learn to follow with promptings. Listen to this. He will nudge you and give you just enough faith to try to speak out in the new language, but you must choose to cooperate with him and try to do so. Your goal is to offer your physical ability to speak for his use, not years. Listen to this. Don't miss this. As long as you are speaking words and sentences you understand in English or whatever languages you may know, you will be speaking out of your brain and intelligence. Your goal is to try to speak out of your spirit where he is stirring you. Okay, uh, so you will feel the spirit starting to prompt you and uh, prompting you to speak. You'll, you'll, you'll sense strange syllables uh, being prompted. And, you, you, and Tim Enlow shared earlier in the book of when he was seeking for the baptism in the Holy Spirit for two years, he would sense these strange syllables and just dismiss them. And then finally he realized that these syllables, 
that he his mind didn't understand. These were the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Uh, when when you speak in tongues, we, we said this, you do not intellectually understand what you are saying. You, you haven't learned that language. You are bypassing your intellect and allowing the Spirit and, and speaking as the Holy Spirit prompts you. Holy Spirit prompts you, but you have to do the speaking. Uh, he, he says, often at this point, people begin to experience different types of prompting from the Holy Spirit. They typically will get a prompting of some strange sounds or syllables. This is when they should begin to speak. If this happens, say them out loud. Your intelligence will try to talk you out of it. But trust the Holy Spirit's leading. He is upon you. Sometimes people feel a physical urge to speak, but are not quite sure what to say. Cooperate with this physical prompting. Take a step of faith. And try to give raw sound to this inner prompting. You will find that when you begin to speak in this new unknown tongue, your mind can still think and may even begin to rationalize what is happening. This is normal. Paul explained, 1 Corinthians 14, 14. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit is praying, but I don't understand what I'm saying. This is very important to understand. You will not understand the words you speak in an unknown tongue. Now, you won't be in a trance. You won't be passed out. You won't be unaware. You can think. And he says, often your intellect will try and talk you out of speaking in this tongue because it sounds like foolishness. But it's you are cooperating with the Holy Spirit and speaking in a language you have not learned, uh, but uh, you, your, your spirit is being uh, edified or built up. And he says, your brain will not like the new language and will likely doubt its authenticity. Your spirit will be released in a new way and you will likely sense an inner strength. From this day forward, you can start and stop speaking in tongues as easily as choosing to yield to the Spirit or not. You do not need to yell or cry. Sometimes our emotions connect and sometimes they do not. Emotions or the lack of them do not validate the concrete sign that He has given you. Whenever you are praying in the Spirit, you are practicing yielding your voice to the Holy Spirit's prompting. And... Uh, Praying in, in tongues as a regular practice, something I do, uh, it builds your spirit. Your mind doesn't understand, but your spirit is edified. Uh, and, uh, boy, that's powerful. But again, the point of speaking in tongues is not just to speak in tongues, but it's a confirmation that you will speak what the Holy Spirit wants you to speak, and that includes when you speak to someone in your own language. Final paragraph, Jesus is the one who baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. If you feel like you are struggling or that there are a million reasons why you can't experience this gift, it's all right. Jesus wants to empower you with his spirit. He will help you and he will fill you. He will navigate around any barriers you put up and any hang-ups you have as long as you continue to pray and receive the gift you don't feel you deserved. And don't ever stop seeking to be filled, ever. So that's a little brief uh, uh, focus on uh, receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And I want to encourage you, if you have not received this experience, I know you love the Lord, you serve Him, and you want everything He has for you. Will you take this to heart? Will you get alone with God and just begin seeking Him? The three stages of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Make yourself vulnerable. Have an awareness that the Spirit is falling on you. And then cooperate with Him. Uh, speak those syllables, those strange sounding syllables. Uh, that's uh, a language that the Holy Spirit is prompting you to speak. It's bypassing your intellect. Uh, but it's flowing through your spirit and empowering you. And uh, that is the gateway. That experience Spirit baptism is the gateway to the fullness of the Holy Spirit flowing in your life, through your life, and accomplishing things that you can't accomplish by yourself.
That's a conclusion to our study. Goodbye, chicken. Hello, dove. Releasing your fears by welcoming the Holy Spirit's power. As we conclude this study tonight, how about you? Have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? If not, I encourage you to seek uh, to receive that experience and don't stop seeking until you receive it. Uh, as uh, understanding the three stages we just spoke about, if you have received this experience, I encourage you to, to pray in tongues and and uh, begin following the Holy Spirit's promptings if you haven't already, just to speak to people. Uh, you might not know everything you should say or how the conversation's going to go, but uh, obey that initial nudge, that prompting, and the Holy Spirit will lead you. He, he'll, he won't let you down. He'll help you. And uh, wow, that, this is what we were made for. This is what we were designed for. Uh, this is what we were saved for. Uh, and uh, someone said, well, can I get to heaven without the baptism in the Holy Spirit? The answer is absolutely yes, you can. But uh, another part of that answer is, but man, we need it to live in this life, the life that God wants us to live. We need it for this life. So I encourage you to seek that if you haven't received it. If, if you have, continue seeking to be filled over and over again so the Spirit's power flows in your life. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for uh, this powerful, powerful study on receiving and uh, releasing the Holy Spirit's power in our lives. Lord, I pray for those who've watched any or all of these uh, sessions uh, who want to be used of you in a greater way than they are now, but perhaps they're overcome with fear or feelings of inadequacy. Uh, Lord, the, the, we all have those. Those are human reactions. But help us to know uh, that uh, through the baptism in the Holy Spirit and the Spirit flowing in our lives, you can puncture that ceiling of human limitation and you can flow through us and use us in a supernatural way. God, this is available for every single believer. Lord, there's, there's not one believer for whom this... Uh, uh, life, this experience, and this Holy Spirit lifestyle is not available. So, Lord, uh, just stir our hearts, all of us, wherever we are in our spiritual walk and in our experience with the Holy Spirit, stir all of us to be continually filled to overflowing with your Holy Spirit, to speak uh, in, in tongues as a sign of confirmation that we are filled with your Spirit, and then to be used of you to speak life. Uh, to those around us in a supernatural way beyond our own ability. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you've been made available to us. Thank you, Jesus, for pouring out your Holy Spirit to us. Now bless each one, and may they walk in a new dimension of the Spirit's power. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being with us tonight and for these sessions. As I said, if it's uh, too much to get all in one sitting, feel free to go back over the recorded version of this and pick out uh, some salient points to, uh, to mull over, to ponder, and to apply to your life. Next Wednesday, uh, October 20th, we will uh, resume our uh, study of the volumes of the Immersed Bible. Uh, we are, uh, will begin a Volume 5, Poets. Uh, we have some copies left at the church. Uh, if you um, didn't get yours, uh, you can uh, you can get them. You can get one uh, this Sunday. We'll have them available for you. And uh, if you can't make it into the church um, on Sunday, you can uh, make an appointment to come at another time, or you can uh, get a copy on uh, Amazon. Uh, you can also order a digital copy if that's what you prefer. Uh, and uh, we're going to begin this great volume of poets. We're going to uh, get back into the reading through the, the Bible. And volume five, next to the last volume. So we'll begin that next week. So I look forward to, to uh, going through that with you. Well, God bless you. Uh, thank you for joining me tonight. Have a great uh, rest of the evening. And we'll see you next time.